From George Vandeman's friend Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story comes this fascinating report. It was in the mud and slime of a peat bog in a Japanese farmyard 25 miles southeast of Tokyo that a team of workmen came upon an amazing discovery. A team of archaeologists rushed to the sea. 18 feet down, they had found the remains of a canoe and something else. One archaeologist climbed into the pit, reached down, parted the soil with his hands, then crying out, he drew back. What was it? Stay with us and you'll find out. It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today It Is Written presents our Canadian associate speaker, Henry Feyerabend, and his message, The Twilight of Death. And now, back to that Kemigawa farmyard. Breathless moments passed. Others converged. It was agreed that only one scientist in all of Japan would be qualified to carry on from there. Dr. Ikiru Oga. Dr. Oga was notified, rushed in from Tokyo to the excavation site, and as he peered down into the bog, as his eyes fell upon its secret, his pulse quickened. Great Scott, is it dormant? Or is it possibly alive? It was decided that this find must be removed to some place, lest it come to life. These scientists had heard of giant reptiles discovered in peat bogs and mammoths trapped in sheets of ice with skin, organs, everything preserved. But now they seem to have discovered something from thousands of years past and still living. We don't know the details of how the find was removed to the safety of a laboratory. We know it got there and in four days under lab-created climactic conditions, there was perceptible movement. Cameramen were summoned to record this unprecedented resurrection. Japan's scientific community was alerted to the surprise that there was life left over from the time of the Caesars of Rome. A living thing had survived from prehistoric Japan. What had they found? In the peat deposit, 18 feet below the earth, cradled in the fossilized remains of a canoe, a 2,000-year-old, dormant, ungerminated, apparently lifeless seed. And after four days, a sprout. After 14 months, a delicate pink lotus flower. That seed that went to sleep when Jesus did was now awake. Jesus was the conqueror of death. Death is our enemy. And the Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. If you should visit Cairo today and take streetcar number 14 to the end of the line, you would be met by shrieking dragomans donkey drivers, camel drivers, all looking for bakshish. The sounds of the past are no longer heard. The groans of the slaves have been silenced. The Nile wind has swallowed up the whistle of the whiplash and blown away the harsh odor of human sweat. Nothing but the structures remain. Today, you can climb to the top of the pyramid of Cheops, highest and largest of them all, and look around at many pharaonic monuments rising in the distance, the tombs for the chosen few who had their names written by the nameless in stone against the sky, there to endure for an eternity. What would justify these elaborate constructions in which thousands of lives were sacrificed in forced labor? One pharaoh spent 20 years in the building of his tomb sapped the strength of the Egyptian people, weighed down his children and his children's children with enormous debts. The common man had to be satisfied with a grave in the sand. 
it was a belief in the hereafter and a desire to find eternal security and eternal life because nobody wants to die. Death is an enemy. Death wasn't in the original plan for this world. It's an alien, an intruder. It isn't a part of the shepherd's flock. It's the wolf that comes to, to kill and to destroy. The fair fields of this world are marred with graves. Our cities are filled with cemeteries. Almost every family has a burial place where they carry flowers from time to time. The earth is covered with grass-grown mounds under which sleep the generations of men. And even the sea isn't without its dead. Its waves are defiled with the carcasses of men, and on its floor lie the bones of the slain. Our enemy, death, has been everywhere, with sword and fire ravaging the human race. In every country of the world, death has created sorrow and weeping. The cry of the bereaved, the wail of the widow, the moan of the orphan, these sounds make up the war music of death. It is these sounds and in these sounds that death has found a song of victory. What is death? Ask someone who has just stood around a freshly dug grave. Someone who has just buried half his heart. Death is a thief that robs the friend from your side and the child from its mother's bosom. It snatches away the breadwinner of the home or the mother who is the light of that home. It steals the blooming youth away from its parents, even though by so doing it crushes the parents' fondest hopes. It doesn't care for our crying. Death has no pity on the young and no mercy on the old. Unfortunately, every doctor must ultimately lose his patient. Burton Russell, whose beauty of prose makes his pessimism all the more terrifying, portrays the movement of the whole human race to oblivion. He says, brief and powerless is man's life. On him and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls, pitiless and dark. Blind to good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way, for man condemned today to lose his dearest, tomorrow himself to pass through the gate of darkness. It remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow falls, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his day. Maurice Maeterlinck once wrote, All seek happiness and receive only death. Death is such a greedy enemy that the blood of all the nations together can't satisfy it. Nobody escapes. A man may manage to escape for many a year until his gray beard seems to defy the winter blast, but finally he must yield. The strongest man on earth is no match for death. The wealthiest person doesn't have the money to bribe destruction. The wisest scholar cannot out-scheme this monster. The crowned monarch and the slave must face this enemy together, for in death scepters and shovels are akin. The sword and the spade are made of light metal. The prince is the brother to the worm and must dwell in the same house, because to everyone it is true, dost thou art and unto dust thou shalt return, Genesis 3, 19. Death is lurking everywhere. You never know where his ambush will be found. At the table, he assails men in their food. At the fountain, he poisons their drink. He waits on the city streets, seizes people in their beds, rides on the stormy sea, walks with people on solid land. On the summits of the Alps, 
Men have fallen into their graves in the deep places of the earth where the miner goes to find the precious ore. Many of them have been sacrificed. Death is a subtle foe who with noiseless footsteps follows close at our heels when we least expect him. His great dragnet gathers in every person in the world. But the good news is that death will someday be destroyed. Oh, death, someday we will go to your funeral. A man's life passes by, oh, so swiftly. The older we get, the faster the years fly by. In the Bible, we have a number of word pictures depicting the brevity of our years on this earth. The psalmist says in uh, Psalm 39, verse 5, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. A handbreadth was used as a unit for measurement in those days, and David sees a man's life as one handbreadth. In the 90th Psalm, he says these words, We spend our years as a tale that is told. Psalm 90, uh, verse 9. How quickly time flies when you're listening to an interesting story or watching an exciting movie. The words, the end, and then the credits begin to roll, and you know that the story is over. That's what life is like. The beauty of a sunset defies description, but there's a certain sadness in that beauty. It means that the day is over, and the last moments of daylight are slipping by. So it is with life. We come to the twilight years, and we know that life's day is fading away. But friend, death has had a long victorious day, and it too has come to its sunset years. It's now living in a lingering twilight that is soon to end. Death received a mortal blow when Jesus came to this world. First of all, he challenged the power of death. He forced death to give up its prey on three occasions that are recorded in the New Testament. He visited a ruler's house where a little girl lay dead, and there were mourners all around her. He put them out of the room. He didn't need them. There was nothing to mourn about anymore, because he said to the little girl, Maid, arise! And the prison door of death was flung wide open. The funeral was ruined because there was no more body to lay in the grave. In fact, Jesus spoiled every funeral that he ever attended. One day at the gates of the city of Nain, he met a funeral procession. In the casket they were carrying was the body of a young man, the only son of a widow. He said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And the young man pushed up the lid of the coffin. And with the health and strength of youth, he leapt out of it onto the ground and into the arms of his waiting mother, leaving the pallbearers with an empty box to carry. Oh, what I've given to see, what I would have given to see the startled faces of all the witnesses who saw that scene. Jesus came to a tomb of his friend Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. He had been dead for so long that his sister said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. But that made no difference to Jesus. Jesus called him from the grave, and he came out wrapped in grave clothes. And the conquering Christ said, Loose him and let him go. Death's bounds were removed. The captive was delivered. And death was humbled and became a servant to Jesus. Christ vanquished death thoroughly when he came from the tomb. That tomb could not hold him. I've been there and looked into that tomb, and I can assure you it is empty today. The resurrection is a fact. It is truth. Truth is not what I believe. Truth isn't even what I know. Truth is fact. It doesn't depend on the unsettled and, un and the changing opinions of human beings. 
It was truth before anyone believed it, and it remains truth whether anyone believes it or not. The resurrection is truth. Here are some of my reasons for believing in the resurrection of Christ. In the first place, Christ said He would arise from the dead, and I believe in Christ. In the second place, the angel at the empty tomb testified to His resurrection. Here it is. He is not here, for He is risen. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Matthew 28, 6. In the third place, He made at least eight appearances, and one of those was to 500 witnesses all at one time. We find that in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and 6. My fourth reason, after His resurrection, He affirmed by His personal testimony. He said, and here are His words, Behold, my hands and my feet, handle me and see. Luke 24, verse 39. In the fifth, my fifth reason for believing the resurrection is that Christ reaffirmed it through revelation. And here it is. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 1, 18. My sixth reason for believing in the resurrection is that the resurrection belief was a driving force in the early church. The early Christian believers went forth in spiritual conquest. Before them were the hatred of the Jews and the scorn of the Romans. They faced the mouths of the lions and the fires of the stake. Their bodies, soaked with oil, were made into living, burning torches to light the arena as their fellow believers were torn by lions and tigers. They perished in prison and in dungeon. They felt the sharp, cutting edge of the sword, the stab of the dagger, and the blow of the headman's axe. Thousands lived in the dark, dank catacombs in the bowels of the earth beneath the city of Rome. What sustained them through those earthly terrors? It was faith in the crucified and risen Christ. We're told that at the Battle of Inkerman, a famous conflict of the Crimean War, a wounded soldier crawled into his tent. He was found there face down, his hand glued by his own blood to the pages of an open Bible. And when his hand was lifted, these printed letters were seen. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John eleven twenty five. The story is told of a Muslim who said to a native preacher in India, You Christians must admit that we Muslims have one thing which you don't have. When we go to Mecca, we find a coffin and know that Muhammad's body is in that coffin. But when you Christians go to Jerusalem, your Mecca, you find nothing but an empty grave. Thank you, said the preacher. You see, your God is dead. Ours is alive. By His resurrection, Christ guaranteed as an absolute certainty the resurrection of all those who are now sleeping in their graves. He conquered death. He killed death. Death may seem like a dragon with a fiery tail, but friend, its sting is gone. It may seem like a roaring lion, but its teeth are broken. The resurrection is the destruction of death. And those who are dead will par participate in the resurrection. How can that be? How could all of the matter that made up their bodies be brought together again? What about those who were devoured by beasts? 
Oh, friend, I don't believe that every particle of every body will be gathered up and the identical material rise from the grave. That isn't even necessary. But that happy day when that sad cemetery will become the happiest place in the world, when the place that is now a place of separation will become a place of glad reunion, the same identity will come out of the grave or out of the earth where there's no grave or out of the sea, and those who arise will be none the worse for the experience. They'll be complete victors over death. No trace of feebleness, old age. No marks of long, wearying sickness. No trace of martyrdom. Every trace of decay will be removed. That triumph will be complete. That is why Paul could say, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and 55, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? So complete will be the victory over death that the Bible says there will be no more death. Listen to the words of Revelation 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Jesus says, because I live, ye shall live also. We look forward to a tearless, sorrowless, graveless future. Death will be totally destroyed. Friend, you and I are living in the twilight of death. The Bible says that death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. And if the last enemy is destroyed, after the last enemy is gone, there can be no more enemies. The battle is fought and the victory is won forever. It was Christ who won that victory and we give Him all the honor and all the glory and all the majesty because He assures us that death is a conquered foe and it doesn't hold any more terror for you and me. The last enemy is destroyed and after the last there can be no enemies. Oh yes, Christians are sorry when someone dies. It hurts, but Paul says they sorrow not as do others who have no hope. For you see, you and I have a hope. We have something to look forward to. We know that death's long day has come to a close. And we know that those loved ones who, from whom we have been separated will come forth from the graves and we'll meet them again. Listen to this. Let me see this world, dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes. A world Don't want you, Lord. 
just know I'd serve you more faithfully. I just know I'd serve you more faithfully. Thank you, Frank. Let us pray. Bless every viewer now, especially those who are mourning the death of a loved one. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have you wondered long hours about what happens after death? George Vandeman has written a book that pushes away this strange, impenetrable mystery. And we want you to have this book. It's yours for the asking. Here is the information that you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. The offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. Please write to our familiar address. Just It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario. Please mention the offer by name and write to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. It's been a real pleasure to be in your home. Thank you for tuning in to It Is Written. And as George Vanderman says, It Is Written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.